everybody. Thank you for being here. It's a nice full room. Um, as there, many of you know, I'm Jeff Science, and I am the Chief Performance Officer and the Deputy here at OMB. And I'm going to spend uh, less than the next 10 minutes giving you some context for our overall contracting reform efforts and also uh, announce a major new initiative that we're launching today. I'll then turn things over to Dan, um, who all of you know is the Administrator of the Office of Federal Procurement Policy. He'll provide more color and detail on our work. Then we'll hear from three of our colleagues, who Dan will introduce in a minute, who are playing leading roles in their agencies. Uh, efforts to reform contracting. And then we'll open it up for a few questions with the goal of having a hard stop no later than 2.30. Um, my job as Chief Performance Officer and the job of my colleagues, including most of you in the room here, um, is to make the federal government work as well as the best performing organizations in the world. And you know, while the private sector has experienced a productivity boom across the last couple of decades, the federal government's productivity as a whole has remained relatively flat. As a result, too many uh, agencies and bureaus have lagged behind with outdated processes and technologies. Um, this is something that uh, we can't tolerate at any time, but particularly given the current fiscal situation. The President has made cutting waste and increasing efficiency and getting the most from taxpayer dollars a priority since the very beginning of his administration. And a few weeks ago, the President and the Vice President launched the campaign to cut waste. Uh, the campaign builds on our efforts over the past two years, including the lessons we learned from the successful implementation of the Recovery Act, which has had unprecedented low levels of fraud and abuse. We've created the Government Accountability and Transparency Board of agency inspector generals, CFOs, and deputy secretaries. This is very much modeled off of the RAT board. The board will architect and drive innovative technologies to prevent fraud and waste. Um, additionally, the vice president will be playing the same Sheriff Joe role that he played in the Recovery Act and will hold cabinet secretaries accountable to continue to make progress across all of our management priorities. So for example, take the management priority of reducing improper payments. These are the tens of billions of dollars in erroneous payment the government makes each year. Uh, payments to the wrong person or at the wrong time or in the wrong amount. We've taken aggressive action here, um, including the creation of the first ever government-wide do not pay list and the deployment of state-of-the-art fraud detection tools, these are having an impact. And just last year, we recaptured about $700 million in improper payments and avoided billions of dollars of additional improper payments. Reducing our real estate um, footprint is another management priority. We've been free, working to free up the billions of dollars tied up in the thousands of buildings and properties that the government no longer needs to own. We're on track to meet the President's goal of saving $3 billion in real estate expenses by the end of fiscal year 2012. And capturing the learning from this process, we have a plan that is now in front of Congress to create even greater savings. We've proposed an independent board that will change really how Washington works by asking Congress to take an up or down vote on bundles of properties to sell or consolidate. This new approach would save us another $15 billion over the next three years, so we're hoping that Congress passes it quickly. We've also been changing how the government buys and manages information technology, putting an end to the practice of throwing good money after bad on projects that are over budget or behind schedule or will never deliver on their promised functionality. We've gone very deep on about 60 projects and done nuts and bolts uh, reviews of those projects. And as a result, we've actually decided to terminate some of the projects altogether. Overall, we've reduced the budgets for those 60 uh, projects by about $3 billion and counting. And most importantly, we've cut delivery time in half, which will help drive efficiency and service quality gains. We're now in the midst of making the structural changes required to drive sustainable IT 
improvements across all of government. This includes increasing accountability for performance, creating a dedicated career path for the first time for IT project manage program management, adopting shared solutions, and then wherever possible, moving to cloud-based solutions. Let me now turn to today's topic, contracting. Like with all of our management priorities, we've made a lot of progress across the last couple of years. Um, as you can see on this slide, on my right, um, the, for the eight years before President Obama took office, from 2000 to 2008, the government spending on contracting grew 12% year over year. It more than doubled, and contracting spending in 2008 was greater than $500 billion. With all this growth, it's probably not surprising that you know, taxpayer dollars were being spent on some contracts that were not very efficient and some that were wasteful. At the beginning of the administration, President Obama put a stake in the ground that we would stop this unsustainable growth and restore fiscal responsibility. He set a goal of saving $40 billion in contracting by the end of fiscal year 11. Thanks to the hard working uh, the hard work of contracting professionals, many of whom are in this room, across government, agencies are now buying less, pooling their purchasing power to drive down unit price, and minimizing the use of cost plus and sole source contracts. These efforts are working. As you can see here, total contracting actually went down last year. This is the first decrease in government-wide contracting in 13 years years. In fact, agencies spent $80 billion less than they would have spent had contracting continued to grow at that 12% per year rate that it had grown under the prior administration. And the good news is that we're seeing this downward trend continue so far this year. Of course, like with all of our management priorities, we're not declaring victory. There are opportunities for further reform and savings, and to that end, today we're announcing a new savings initiative. We're targeting the contracts for management support services. This is a segment of that overall contracting. These are IT program management, acquisition support, and other management support services that agencies regularly contract out for. Here's total spending on those management support service contracts. On the left, you can see that agencies spent approximately $10 billion in 2000. However, spending on these services has grown even faster than contracting overall. Spending actually quadrupled across the decade. And in 2010, we spent roughly $40 billion on these types of contracts. While many of these contracts do provide valuable services, some of these contracts are unnecessary and can be reduced. Sometimes agencies are spending money on consultants to write reports that really don't go anywhere. They sit on the shelf. And in some situations, it's, it's hard to distinguish, actually, between contractors and federal employees. And believe it or not, there are still cases where we have contractors managing other contractors, clearly an unacceptable loss of control and oversight. So clearly, bottom line here is there are contracts for management support services that should be eliminated that we can no longer afford. Today, we're calling on all agencies to reduce their spending on these contracts by a minimum of 15%. So if you do the math, 15% on the $40 billion, this totals $6 billion across the government. And it's an important next step in making contracting more efficient. We'll be tracking and reporting progress in the months to come to make sure that we hit our $6 billion tar target by the end of fiscal year 12. In closing, this is really what the President's campaign to cut waste is all about. It's about building on the progress we've made, but continuing to push for more, whether in contracting, improper payments, real estate, or IT. We will continue to hold ourselves accountable for results. Let me turn it over now to Dan to give uh, an overall update on our contracting work and a little more color on the $6 billion goal. Dan. Thank you, Jeff. I want to join Jeff in welcoming you all to this forum 
It's a pleasure to see you. Lots of people here I've spent a lot of time with uh, during my time as administrator from the agencies, uh, from the Hill, from industry, from associations. We're very glad that you're able to join us. Um, as Jeff said, I want to, I think you said, put a little color, uh, add in some details because we've got a lot of acquisition knowledge in this room and I want to fill in some details about the goal uh, what we're focused on and why we're focused on it for the management support services. And then I'm going to pivot to more general statements about the progress we've made over these couple of years in improving acquisition. We are focused when we talk about management support services on something very specific and it will be completely transparent. Our friends from GAO, from the agencies, from industry and the Hill will be able to follow exactly what we're doing. We're focused on 15 what are called product or service codes, PSCs, um, and we'll be happy to share with you after this session exactly what 15 codes we're talking about. If you looked at those 15 codes for FY10, you'll see the $40 billion in spending, and of course you can get that information, it's publicly available from FPDS, the Federal Procurement Data System. There are different labels that are sometimes used for all or part of that collection of codes. We're calling them management support services as a convenient shorthand. You'll also, many people in this room will know the term advisory and assistance contracts, professional and technical services, knowledge-based services. Those labels cover some or all of what we're talking about. But the 15 product and service codes let you know exactly what we mean. That's what we're talking about. Why are we focused on them? As Jeff said, the most obvious reason is that's where the money is. That's where the spending is increasing. I'm not sure that this is the area where it, the spending is absolutely fastest, but it's certainly increasing faster than procurement spending was in the prior decade. As Jeff showed you, um, we're talking about quadrupling of spending in this area over the prior decade. Not only that, it's not only a question of quantity, there are also issues of quality. The fact is this is an area that tends to be high risk for the federal government and high risk for the taxpayers. If you look at the chart up here, and I know some of you may have trouble seeing it, let me sort of briefly walk you through it. On the left-hand side, you see the breakdown for federal procurement spending overall. And you'll see there that it's mostly fixed price. Something like 36% of overall federal procurement dollars are running through cost reimbursement or time and materials contracts, both of which shift at least some and sometimes much of the cost risk to the agency and therefore to the taxpayers. Now look at the right-hand column. Those are our 15 product and service codes, management support services. There, you'll see that the top part, fixed price, is now a minority. Instead of being a majority, it's a minority, and instead, cost reimbursement, and especially time and materials, labor hour contracts, have grown to become the majority. They are together something like 74% of the dollars spent in this area. It's an area of high risk, consistent with OMB's focus since the beginning of the administration on driving down high risk, we focused on this area. In addition, and Jeff alluded to this, the functions being performed under these management support services are the ones that are most likely to get close to inherently governmental functions, functions where it's not clear that the federal government is retaining control of its mission and operations. That's why in guidance that we issued to the agencies last fall to the, on the civilian agency side, we said, when you put together your service contractor inventories at the civilian agencies, we want you to pay particular attention to these 15 product and service codes. We called them functions of special interest and we're pursuing that here. I want to underscore another point that Jeff made. Contractors are enormously valuable to us in many areas, including in management support services. Contractors provide extremely helpful assistance to us, and we will continue 
to rely on contractors to, for support. What we're saying is we need to spend less money. We simply cannot continue spending the amount of money for management support services that we've been spending. There will be agencies or parts of agencies that will say we need the services. That's really a program decision and not a contracting shop decision. And our answer to them in that case is then you're going to need to find your savings by negotiating, for example, fixed prices instead of time and materials, or at least negotiating for a lower hourly rate if that's the way we're paying it. But when we can, we need to cut back on these services so that we can reach this 15% goal by the end of fiscal 12 and drive the spending from $40 billion down to $34 billion. Again, there will be complete transparency. This is publicly available data. We will be discussing this with all of the agencies, in particular at what we call the ACSTAT sessions, the acquisition status sessions, which are an opportunity for us to hear about their successes and share them across the government, but also to hear challenges that they're facing. I should say that there are agencies already making progress in this area. Just to name one, I know the Department of Commerce has been very focused on cutting back on its use of management support services and negotiating better rates and fixed prices for the services that it does need. Let me, uh, at this point, pivot to a few brief remarks about the progress we're making overall. As Jeff said, we're buying less. But what's particularly the focus of our efforts in the acquisition community is buying smarter. I want to highlight three areas and just in headline form mention a few of the points of progress that I'm seeing. I'm going to talk briefly about the acquisition workforce, about acquisition planning, and about contract management, all three of which have historically, I would say at least for the last 15 years, been areas of great challenge for our agencies. The acquisition workforce has gone through, for this administration, a dozen years of inattention, some would say neglect. We have worked hard during these two years to build up the acquisition workforce. That means targeted hiring, but just as importantly, a focus on training for the acquisition workforce. And the acquisition workforce writ large, not just contracting officers and contract specialists, but the entire team, the program and project managers they work with, the contracting officers' representatives, also called contracting officers' technical reps, or the COTARs, cost and pricing specialists, their skills that have atrophied over these past 15 years, and we are working hard to rebuild them. I should also say that, that there's a matter of more attention being paid to the acquisition workforce. I'm proud to say that in our office, we re-inaugurated or reinvented, if you will, the frontline forum that existed in the 90s. And there are a couple of representatives of the frontline forum in the room with us today, contracting officers and frontline contracting officials that come to the White House complex four times a year to talk with us in the Office of Federal Procurement Policy about the challenges they face and to share their perspectives. One other sign of, I think, in encouragement on the side, of, on the part of the acquisition workforce, a group of junior acquisition professionals at the Department of Education initiated what's become a government-wide network of rising acquisition professionals. And again, I'm happy that some of those people from the network of rising acquisition professionals is here in the room. We are working on raising the standards for the acquisition workforce. For example, we are issuing stricter certification requirements for the civilian agency's contracting officer's representative. We are giving agencies guidance on setting up specialized cadres of acquisition professionals in the IT area, especially helpful to help with very large IT programs, whereas Jeff's, as Jeff pointed out, we faced challenges in the past. Again, because of time, I want to be very brief, but a few words about acquisition planning and contract management. We've often in the past focused on the award of the contract, 
but not paid enough attention to what comes before that, good acquisition planning, and what comes after that, good contract management. We have focused on acquisition planning, whether it's thinking about small businesses, being sure that you're not dealing with, an, with a, an unjustifiably bundled procurement. Are you looking for set-aside opportunities for small businesses? We're looking for opportunities to increase competition because uncompeted contracts, especially sole source contracts, are a source of risk for the federal government and we're trying to drive down that risk. In that regard, I'll mention that we're about to release a new FPDS, Federal Procurement Data System, report on competition, which will provide more transparency and more accurate information into the kind of competition that we're having, in particular at the order level under task and delivery order contracts. We are also promoting strategic sourcing in our acquisition planning so that instead of starting off on a new contract, we can have agencies take advantage of existing government-wide contracts. This is an area where GSA, and we're happy to have Martha Johnson with us today, GSA has taken the lead in creating government-wide contracts that are saving taxpayer funds and getting more business to small businesses. I should say that the office supplies a strategic sourcing effort is leading to more than 72% of the dollars going to the small businesses, which own 13 of the 15 agreements in that effort. One last thing I want to mention about acquisition planning, the Mythbusters campaign. One of the things that we've come to understand is too often we get into a bad contract because we didn't do our homework during acquisition planning, and that's often because some people thought we couldn't talk to industry. We need to talk to industry. We need to listen and learn from industry. And we are working hard through what we call the Mythbusters campaign to increase communication from industry. I will also tell you, we've only just begun in that effort. This will be an ongoing effort with more and more outreach to make our people feel comfortable with what is, I recognize, a cultural change to increasing communication with industry. A couple of quick words on contract management and then I need to wrap up because of time. I mentioned we're strengthening the contracting officer representative function through training and certification. We're also pushing better write-ups of past performance. When we have a contractor that does a very good job, as many of them do, we need to record that so that other contracting officers can know that this contractor did a particularly good job. Similarly, if a contractor doesn't do a good job, that needs to be put into the past performance database system. And we are weak in recording information and being sure that the information is useful. We're working on that now by standardizing the kind of inputs and giving more training. Finally, suspension and debarment. The fact is, the vast majority of our contractors are terrific and they're doing a very good job. But when we do have an entity that is not one we should be doing business with, we need to take action. And I'm happy to see that the Small Business Administration and other agencies are reinvigorating their suspension and debarment programs. You're going to hear from one of our colleagues in just a moment about the efforts at USAID and their successes at strengthening their suspension and debarment program. With that, I'd like to turn to our guests. Uh, let me do very brief introductions of all three, then we'll have our three guests speak, then we'll have questions. First, Rafael Boras, DHS's Undersecretary for Management, who will be talking about some of DHS's successes in buying smarter. Then we're going to hear from Hilda Ariano, counselor at USAID, who, as I said, will be talking about USAID's efforts to crack down on irresponsible entities. And finally, we're going to be hearing from Richard Ginman, the Director of Defense Procurement and Acquisition Policy. Dick will tell us about the good results that the Navy got through tough negotiations and the skills of a particularly good Navy contracting officer. With that, let me turn the floor over to Rafael. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Let me start by thanking Jeff for his leadership on uh, so many different management initiatives. We appreciate that, and Dan in particular in the acquisition area, which is what we're here to talk about today. Uh, at Homeland Security, uh, we've un unveiled a series of uh, initiatives to cover so many of the areas that Dan talked about. Uh, but the one I'd like to talk about today that we're very proud of is what we've done in strategic sourcing. Uh, back in uh, March of 2009, the Secretary, Secretary Napolitano, initiated an, uh, an initiative called her Efficiency Initiative. And this is an initiative <clears throat> that she brought uh, with, uh, from uh, Arizona and uh, initiated at the department. And uh, that initiative coincided with some guidance issued by OMB uh, to get smarter uh, about contracting. Uh, so both of these uh, initiatives came together at a good time and produced what I like to say a really good emphasis around good smart contracting and a good initiative around savings. Our strategic uh, sourcing initiative is really the highlight of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, since January 2009, we've been able to document uh, about $587 million worth of savings. Now, we've had that independently verified. And just to give you a sense of the magnitude of it, in 2010, about $2.9 billion of our spend were strate strategically sourced. Now, that's about 18% of our overall spend. And that's just in the second year of this really big initiative, really big push. Uh, we've been able to do that, though, by maintaining a exceptionally uh, high small business uh, uh, contracting uh, uh, participation uh, uh, goal. And we routinely exceed our, uh, our required goal of 23 percent and live at around 33 percent, so we do a, an excellent job internally at DHS in meeting our small business goals. But in particular, one of the criticisms, of course, has been over the years is that strategic sourcing initiatives can be uncompetitive or can lead to a reduction in businesses, uh, business for small businesses. And we have found that to be exactly the opposite for us. Uh, we are about 36 percent of our contracts that have been strategically sourced have gone to small business. So we're really proud of that. Uh, we've achieved, been able to achieve this success in primarily three, three areas. Uh, one being a, a very basic one in office supplies. We spend almost $100 million a year in office supplies. And DHS started by putting together some strategic source contracts. And it really was a sort of an integration collaboration effort because it helped bring different parts of the, of the department come together around smart and collective buying. And then we joined up with GSA on their uh, 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 federal strategic sourcing initiative, and uh, we expect um, uh, to, you know, to, to be able to result with even greater savings as a result. So the office supplies, it may sound small, but it's a very, very important, and it showed us, it proved to DHS that we can do it. The second big thing that's resulted in some substantial savings to us, and also uh, it's produced some great operational efficiencies, is around uh, software licenses, enterprise license agreements. So again, we use a, sort of the same model working with all of DHS uh, to come together and collaborate and take a look at what we're buying, what we're using, what we could use, how we can use it better. And that's resulted in about, to date, about $82 million worth of savings. And that will continue to grow because, again, we've just begun uh, that effort uh, around enterprise license agreements. Uh, so that's taking off uh, very, very well. The third area that uh, helps us uh, meet our small business uh, goals and something that we're really uh, proud of is an uh, initiative uh, called PACS, which is our program management administrative clerical uh, contract. And this is specifically a contract set aside for service-disabled veteran-owned businesses. And this has just been uh, a, a really fabulous example of strategically sourcing, where we did two things. We, we did that around IT, so it's primarily geared for IT spending. And we've, if you will, strategically sourced a market, the service-disabled veteran-owned businesses. Uh, to be able to put a big initiative around that. And uh, that one as well has been uh, extremely successful for us. Uh, we have spent uh, on PACS uh, uh, over $95 million, almost $100 million, uh, with service-disabled veteran-owned business in the IT area. So it's competitive within that uh, realm. These are just three examples, and certainly there are many, many more within the department, but they're just three examples uh, that um, uh, coming around the strategic sourcing initiative has had a tremendous benefit and ancillary benefits as well in terms of operational efficiencies. 
That's great. Rafael, thanks very much. I will say that uh, what you all have done at DHS has been, it's a, it, it's a nice example of your taking initiatives, sharing them through us government-wide, and then us being able to share things back and forth, such as the office supplies expansion to the government-wide approach. Thank you very much. Let's see. Hilda, you're going to talk to us about USAID's experience. Yes, thanks, and uh, thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Dan, for um, having us here with you today. It really is uh, great to be part of an event that talks about uh, increased cost savings and accountability, which at USAID is something we deal with and struggle with every day of the week, given our presence worldwide in over 100 countries. Um, USAID stands strongly behind the administration's goals to deliver efficient and effective government. Uh, through our new reform package, we have a set of seven reforms under the umbrella of USAID Forward that really are looking at every aspect of our operations. Procurement reform is a major piece of that, the one that we're, we're referring to this afternoon. Um, we uh, deal with a variety of organizations worldwide that execute our programs on the ground. Um, we meet the expectations laid out for us by the President and the Secretary of State um, through a variety of NGOs, civil society organizations, host country organizations, small and large business organizations that work in some of the more remote and uh, difficult areas of the world. Uh, we refer to our contractors as partners. Um, largely because our contractors del de deliver, in many cases, a full set of technical services um, that help us approach a variety of development challenges. For example, a low enrollment among school children or maternal mor mortality that are not a quick fix unidimensional item, but really require our contractors to engage in a complex set of activities on the ground. Because of the nature of our work and um, some of the more challenging social and economic and political circumstances we work in, our contractors or partners really must work with us together in development. Um, we expect them to operate with us in the true spirit of partnership while contractually delivering effective and sustainable development solutions to the beneficiaries we work with. Um, that's sort of the backdrop for where we have come into the procurement reform agenda. Um, we expect our partners, and we are, we think, very successful in most cases, to uh, ensure the accountability and integrity within their organizations, their systems, and their personnel. We expect them to meet the compliance standards of the United States government. And if something goes wrong, and here is a very important point, we certainly expect them to come to us immediately to remedy it and reduce any further cost to the U.S. taxpayer. With this expectation in mind, and to hold our partners and our agency more fully accountable for our contracts, we've stood up the Compliance and Oversight Performance Partner Performance Division. Um, and we have created a senior level suspension and debarment task team, which is led by the USAID deputy administrator. All of this moving toward addressing high level administrative actions. Um, USAID's new division is dedicated to proactively tracking trends on partner performance and catching issues early on. A telephone hotline and email box have been set up for disclosure by partners of issues related to mismanagement under USAID programs or any fraud, waste, and abuse related issues. As you can imagine, for us, this is especially important given the complexity of operating environments in which we serve. We are providing fraud awareness training and building best practices for our staff and for our partners. Um, we have hired, as many of you may know, 
um, um, uh, a significant number of new officers in recent years. And as a result of that, the piece that is, as you mentioned, Dan, um, training and mentoring in this area is very, very important. It is not just in the acquisitions area. It is across the board in every, every officer that has responsibility for managing U.S. taxpayer dollars. So the training piece is a complex undertaking. We're working closely with the Interagency Suspension and Debarment Committee, USA, uh, USAID's General Counsel, and our concurrent collaboration with our Office of the Inspector General. Um, this concurrent collaboration really is a best practice for all of us, and redefining those relationships and the level of communication have been especially important. The new compliance division um, will also, uh, is also overseeing our determinations of suspensions, debarments, administrative agreements, and other official actions taken against contractors grant or grantees who violate U.S. laws and regulations or perform unethically while implementing USAI, U.S. government programs. Our accountability efforts are already producing results. Since January 2011 alone, we have taken suspension or debarment actions against 41 individuals or entities. Many of these cases have been in high-risk environments such as Afghanistan, where the agency considers itself most vulnerable. For instance, we took action against a private security firm in Afghanistan for its links to a debarred entity and proposed um, for debarment, 22 Afghan nationals for issues related to fraud. We have learned much over the past few months and from our previous years of experience in operating accountability, uh, accountably in overseas programs. We will continue to learn. We have taken administrative actions related to suspension and we have taken actions against some relatively well-known contractors or partners. Um, we certainly um, have said, um, this has been said by our administrator, that we consider no one too big to fail. This is um, a delicate undertaking, it's a difficult undertaking, but as we move forward as an agency, given the complexity in which we operate, we feel this is necessary and we are um, going to do the necessary to uh, be successful at it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hilda. It is very important. Obviously, as you say, it has to be done in context and with a, in a balanced approach, but you need an office that is adequately staffed to be able to oversee the whole question of suspension and debarment. Thank you. Mr. Jenman, Dick, do you want to talk to us about the DOD context and the uh, Navy's success story in particular? Sure. So, well, good afternoon. Jeff, Dan, thank you for the invitation. Um, today we pause to take account of the progress that's been made over the past year to realize a more efficient and accountable government. Um, Secretary Gates, former Secretary Gates, made clear in May of last year that the Defense Department is entering a new era in defense spending. Um, President Obama's planned defense budgets are strong and robust and will stay so but both the President and Congress have made it clear that the national security part of the budget and defense is uh, approximately 20 percent of the total budget uh, must be part of the overall budget equation for the next several years. We cannot be exempt, we the department cannot be exempt from efforts to bring the federal deficit spending under control. And as we assess how to accomplish the task the President's laid out, um, former Secretary Gates undertook and now Secretary Panetta will continue a comprehensive review of the impact of budget reductions on fourth structure and capability, and ultimately on the missions and America's role in the world. Recognizing the country's fiscal and economic reality, last May the department launched a many-pronged efficiencies initiative to ensure the department's managing its budget in a manner that, as former Secretary Gates put it, is respectful of the taxpayer at an economic and fiscal, I'm sorry, at a time of economic and fiscal distress. As one of those prongs, he tasked Dr. Carter, the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics, and my boss, um, to devise a plan to address the $400 billion that we spend annually under contract 
of the $700 billion DOD base plus wartime budget. Um, this led to what we have called the Better Buying Power initiatives. It was introduced by, by Secretary Gates and by Dr. Carter in September of last year. Um, it is guidance to the defense acquisition workforce for how we can get more without using more. Leading the effort, fundamentally changing the way the department does business, has been Dr. Carter's number two priority, with supporting the warfighter his first priority. To achieve such change, we must not only be deliberate in how we spend money, but also in what we buy. Over the past two years, we have canceled many programs that were either not performing, whose time had passed, um, or where we had already bought enough, and altogether those exceeded $300 billion. The programs we now have underway, um, or which are getting underway, are military capabilities we do need and do want. Um, we need to acquire those capabilities um, that these programs will deliver for our warfighters, um, but do so using money the, the government and the, and the country can afford to allocate to the vital objectives that we have. We are targeting affordability and cost growth. We're incentivizing productivity and innovation in industry, and we're promoting real competition and improving especially the way that we buy services. A shining example of how we've redoubled our efforts to drive a hard bargain, get a better deal for the taxpayers, um, is the Navy's continuity of services contract. For the past 10 years, the Navy has received network support under a commercial contract that left ownership of all infrastructure and intellectual property with the contractor. The Navy developed a strategy for, cost effective, for the cost-effective acquisition of the infrastructure and associated intellectual property by developing a sophisticated modeling technique to catalog and determine the net book value of the individual component parts of the network. This was more than 100, I'm sorry, more than 1 million individual assets located at 2,500 sites around the world. Armed with this knowledge, the Navy was able to aggressively negotiate a price for the, in, for the infrastructure and the intellectual property rights, covering 380,000 computer users um, and 70, I'm sorry, 80 computer seats, 380,000 computer seats and 700,000 users uh, worldwide. This allowed the Navy to save significant resources. Um, in fact, it was in excess of a million dollars uh, below what it was that was originally offered. Um, so they're going to be able to use that money for other needs. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to specifically recognize Ms. Debbie Stroyford, who was the negotiator and contracting officer for the deal. Um, she is off today on a well-earned uh, cruise in Alaska. <laughs> and is represented today by Tim Dowd, uh, sitting in the back, the Director of Contracts at the Space and Warfare Command, and also by uh, Randy DeLarm, the Deputy Program Executive Officer for Enterprise Information Systems in the Navy. We've made significant strides over the past year. Um, there is certainly much more for us to do, as been discussed today. Um, as, we look, as we look ahead, we expect to engage industry to identify further opportunities to reduce cost, to increase our efficiency, and most importantly, get a better deal for the taxpayers. Thank you. Dick, thanks very much. Uh, I might have misheard, but just to be clear, uh, a couple of words about that. I thought I heard that she got a deal that was a million dollars less than they expected to pay and what was originally asked for. I think it was? A million four, or a billion four. Ah. The big we, we, billion. Round, we rounded to an even number. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it was over a billion dollars, over a billion dollars less than when the negotiations started, right? That's a very impressive savings. I should tell you that uh, Debbie Stroyford, uh, it's one of my heroes. We gave her, we, we awarded to her the Chief Acquisition Officer Council Award for extraordinary performance because of the negotiations in that case and the savings she brought the taxpayer. So I, I offer my congratulations to our friends from the Navy. Uh, it is now time for questions. Uh, let me just say a couple of words in terms of ground rules. The, the press is going to have an opportunity afterwards through our communications office. So this section of the, of the questions and answers is for everybody, if you will, in front of the velvet rope there. <laughs> uh, the other ground rule is, let's see, the, I get the easy questions, the tough questions go here, and the super tough questions go to Jeff Zion. Uh, any questions on any of the topics that you've raised, then you should feel free to direct them to the agencies or to us here at OMB. Who wants to get us started? Yes, please, boy. Oh, I should ask you to say your name and your agency, and there are microphones that our colleagues are going to bring to you. 
Yeah, I'll try and ask you an easy one. Um, I'm Willie Smith with the Department of Transportation, and um, this was certainly good from the three guests here, the examples of uh, areas of savings and efficiencies. There are other um, areas that are being looked at and thought about also across um, uh, different departments, and certainly within the Department of Transportation where there may be some opportunities. One of them is reverse auctions, and my question is for you, Dan. Um, given uh, that as a possibility for savings and efficiencies, for agencies that are looking to increase their use of, it, of um, reverse auctions, what, what advice would you give to those agencies, given that the federal government is just now kind of starting to look at that in a different way? Thanks, Willie. Uh, electronic reverse auctions have been around for a good number of years. The Navy, by the way, was a pioneer, I think, in the federal use of electronic reverse auctions. Uh, and I, I should also, uh, Raphael, I should also point out that I think today that DHS may be the leader. My understanding is that over the last two fiscal years, DHS has run more than 2,500 electronic reverse auctions each year, saving tens of millions of dollars and, by the way, getting a disproportionate in a healthy way, disproportionate percentage of the resulting contracts to small businesses. So they have been a win-win-win, typically saving the agencies on the order of 15 to 18 percent lower than what they have been paying historically. One of the challenges is when to use them. And this is, it's a great question, Willie, because it's one that we raised as we spoke with agencies across the government to learn lessons. There are agencies that have used electronic reverse auctions for, uh, uh, for services, but I think, they, I think they'll, they've generally said it should really be a commodity type service, like overnight delivery, for example, rather than a service where you're going to need to tech, do a technical evaluation. Also, they're usually best when price is the only evaluation criterion. As soon as you talk about doing a trade-off between price and something else, you risk putting the vendors in an unfair situation. They compete on price, one of them wins with a low price, and yet they still don't get the contract. So rule of thumb, better for goods than for services, if services then commodity services, and best when price is the only criterion, challenging if you're using other criteria. Next question. Tom Sharp, Treasury. So, Dan, you're saying we have to use less management support services or pay less, even if my department believes it needs them. Tom, it's, it's a very important question. A as you know, we, we routinely have calls with the senior procurement executives across the government. And when we were discussing this issue recently, we heard from agencies that said, we really need management support services. It is a very legitimate concern because contractors are providing us very valuable services. Our answer from OMB is you and your program offices need to make the call. Are you able to reduce use? You should reduce the use where you're able to because we're in tough fiscal times. But where you need the services, you need to find ways to buy smarter. I heard from a civilian agency recently about the negotiations they did with the vendor providing terrific management support services. But because they used the vendor so much, they were able to negotiate lower rates. That's what we're talking about, buying less if you can, but buying smarter when you do buy. Next question. Um, hi, I'm Lisa Willis from USDA, and this question is for Dick. Um, I know one of the initiatives we're working on is trying to use less risky contract types. Could you tell us about DOD's experience in moving away from contract types like time and materials and the other high-risk contracts? Uh, certainly. We've, we've uh, worked very hard to move away from time and material contracts and, and move into, if not a fixed price contract, certainly a cost type contract. Um, within what we call knowledge-based services from 2009 to 2010, we went from 20 percent of our contracts being time and material to 15 percent, so a significant reduction. Uh, I mean, the an anecdotally, and, and I don't have t firm data that I can lay on the table, but at least from the contracting officers that we speak to, they think when we move from a time and material contract to a cost plus in the actual negotiations they've conducted, um, that on average has been a 7 to 10 percent actual reduction in the amount of money they've had to put on the contract to get the same level of service that they would have bought with time and material. 
I, I would add that the FAR is pretty clear the time of material is the least preferred method of contracting. Um, so while cost reimbursement is, is still considered a more risky type contract, um, it is certainly preferred over the time of material. Thank you. Next question. Stan, we'll get you a mic. Uh, Stan Soloway with PSC. Dan, when you talk about the reductions and the strategy that went into the, the strategic thinking you did to set the target, how are you going to or what guidance will you provide to the agencies to how to prioritize and think about the different options, such as what Tom just raised that he faces in his agency? When you shift the cost, if I have to have the capability but I want to reduce my contracting, I would do it organically. There's a cost associated with that, which therefore it's not a linear reduction in cost. It's a reduction in contract spending, but it's not a reduction in cost. Um, how I prioritize, as you said, there's high risk, whether it's contract type or the function being performed. How are you going to take the guidance you issued last year and align it with the current target for reduction so the agencies really are driven to the most strategic approach as opposed to what we have often seen in the past is a little bit less disciplined and kind of salami slicing approach. Thanks, Dan. Um, one of the points that, that you often make and your, your colleagues from the Professional Services Council often make is the importance of making these decisions in a strategic way, in a thoughtful way, and I think it's a very good point. Um, we will work with the agencies, as we always do, to think through the best way to do this. Uh, as you know, we, we have calls in which we discuss these, whether the senior procurement executive calls or meetings through the Chief Acquisition Officers Council. We will work through this with the agencies to be sure that it's done intelligently. We don't want to have, for example, anybody understanding this to, mean a, to be a call for insourcing. That's not what we're talking about at all. We don't want people think think this is a numbers game. All you have to do is put things under a different product service code and you've solved that problem. <laughs> I know that would not cross anybody's <laughs> mind. So we're going to be watching, and the good news is we have, uh, we have colleagues in private industry at GAO and other places who will be helping us watch to be sure we don't do this in a mechanical way, that we do this in a thoughtful way so we reduce risk to the government and still get the great benefit that we need to get from our contractors. Next question. Roger Waldron with the Coalition for Government Procurement. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on contract duplication and what role is that going to play um, in your looking at, at achieving these savings and just savings generally across the government. I mean, costs, I, we hear it from our members all the time in terms of additional costs for the multiple contracts that for the same or similar services that they feel compelled each time an agency puts one out to have to compete for when there's already pre-existing government-wide contracts or even within that same agency already a contract in place, are you going, is this going to, is your pro, this approach going to address that issue as well? Thank you, Roger. Let me say a few words, but my colleagues I should have always pointed out are always welcome to supplement things that I say. Um, contract duplication, it's a very important issue. It's an issue that a GAO has pointed to and people on the Hill have pointed to. Um, we need to avoid duplication. We can't afford duplication. We just don't have money to duplicate. It's not fair to our vendors, and it's a waste of our acquisition professional's time to reinvent the wheel. As a result, what we've done in the Office of Federal Procurement Policy is we've essentially reversed the priorities. There were those in the past who said, your default should be make your own contract. And only if you might find an existing contract out there, then you could use that other contract. And in fact, there were many people who said it's not good to have interagency contracts, it's not good to have government-wide. We've reversed that. What we're saying is before you go down the path for a, of, a, of a new contract using your own acquisition professional's time and your agency's time and money, you should first check to see whether there's an existing contract that could meet your needs. We are about to issue business case guidance to the agencies that will say to the agencies, certainly before you start a large contract, you should be checking to see if an, a government-wide acquisition contract, one of the GWACs, could meet your needs if it's IT. 
if it's in the strategic sourcing area, whether it's office supplies, overnight delivery, or what will soon be wireless, print management, and software licenses, if there's another contract already in place to piggyback off of, we would encourage you to do that first. The last thing you should do, only if you can't use another co agency's contract, if you have no choice, then you should use your own resources to independently contract. I think our approach will reduce the burden on industry, reduce the burden on our contracting shops, and save us money. Let's see one more question. One more, anybody want to add to that? Anybody disagree with me on that? Oh, no, we're safe. <laughs> <laughs> what? One more question, if there is one. Mindy. Hi, uh, Jeff and Dan, thank you for hosting this forum to, to provide clarification. Uh, Mindy Connolly with GSA. Uh, my question is about the Management Support Services Initiative, uh, since that will likely cut across all of the programs in an agency and many of the budgets. Uh, does OMB anticipate designating a single person responsible uh, for, those for that reduction? Thanks, Mindy. This is, uh, this is a, a good example of OMB working across our management team, Jeff, and it, it's something that you always encourage us to do. It's a situation where the different offices within OMB work together and the different offices and the agencies work together, especially when you're talking about using less of the services. That's not something the contracting officers can control. That's a program decision, and as a result, our plan is to work with our colleagues, both in OMB, for example, in the resource uh, management organization part of OMB, but also the rest of the M team here, the management team, so that we can reach out to agencies. They need to be working with their CFO offices. They need to be working with their program offices. If it's IT management support, they need to be working with their CIO offices. We will not succeed in reducing these prices, uh, reducing these costs, if we focus only on the contracting shops. This has to be a shared responsibility. And that's why, for example, in our ACSTAT sessions, we encourage agencies to bring people from outside their contracting shops so that we can have a broader discussion of the way the agency is acting. Thank you. I think, that anybody want to add to that? No. I think with that, because of time, we should wrap up. I want to thank you all for your attendance today. Thank you for your participation. I especially want to thank our guests for telling the stories from their agency successes. Thank you all. Thank you.